Let's take a look at what's coming new to Premiere Pro this fall. Now, all these updates are currently in beta, which you can get from the Adobe Creative Cloud desktop app, which I encourage you to do to test it out and give feedback. So, are these updates good, bad? Do they need improvement? Let's jump on in. So here I have the beta open. Let's click on new project. And you can see project name and location are the same. So let's give it a name. But what is new is this new template dropdown. So you can see you're given a few different templates to work from that are designed for certain workflows. So they come preloaded with sequences and the right aspect ratio and bins ready to have footage imported into them. So you don't have to repeat that each time. So I'm gonna choose the standard template project and I'll also show you how to create your own template as well. I don't need the import mode. So I'm gonna click on create. So now you can see with the standard template project that we have these little folders here. They're empty, but you can add footage into them. And in my case, I use 1080p 29.97 frames per second, not 23.98. So I'm going to right click on this and go to sequence settings and just change this to 29.97, press okay. And I'll just label this 29.97. So now I can be like, okay, I wanna save this as my gal template. I can go up to file and save as template and I can call this gal media template. All right, now let's import our footage to edit a little travel commercial. So I have some log footage shot on a DJI and some red raw footage as well. Let's drag and drop this into our footage folder. So now that I have the footage imported, let's double click to open up our sequence. So let's select all of these clips here and drag and drop them into the timeline. Now we're gonna get this air that says, oh, there's a clip mismatch because the clips do not match the sequence settings, but we don't want to change our sequence settings. We just want to fit our footage to this sequence, which I'll show you in a moment. So we're going to keep the existing settings. So now as we scrub through, you can see everything is just super zoomed in, right? Because some of them are in 4K or even 6K. So this is where we start to get into the new updates. If we select all of the clips, we can go up to the new properties panel and you can see at the top there's fit and fill. There's no longer set or scale to frame size. If we fit this, it'll essentially take the aspect ratio resolution and fit it to our sequence. And if the aspect ratio is different than 16 by nine, which is our current sequence, you'll see these black bars. So to get rid of this, you can just click on fill instead. And now everything is filled exactly to frame. You'll also see that this red raw clip automatically changed. If we go to Lumetri color, you can see it used the correct color space of red log wide gamut and it converted it to rec 709 here but you'll also see that a few clips are still in the log which i will address in a moment there's a quick fix for this so underneath fit and fill you can also adjust the position and the scale here if you need to but what's even cooler is the crop effect is now built in so with all the clips selected let's say you wanted to you know add this kind of different uh, aspect ratio here as letterboxes, you can just type in your values here. You don't have to go search for the effect and it saves you time. If you select a clip, you can also go over here now and you can go to transform and get the transform controls here in the project panel, or you can do crop. And look at this, you can crop directly in the window, which is directly related to this crop. You can see it's at 9.7%. Another thing is this clip is a little bit slow and normally you need to right click and go to speed and duration to bring up speed and duration. But here on properties, you can just click on adjust speed. Let's bring this up to 300%, for example. And now it matches the speed of the other footage better. So let me open up a more refined version of this project. Here you can see that I've added some sounds. I've also added some text on screen. I also added this transition from my toolkit and also this Mogurt at the end here. The properties panel also works with graphics and audio as well. If I'm going to select them all and go to properties now, you can see that I can make edits to all of them at once. For example, if I wanna change the color to white. And now, they're all changed. It's a huge time saver. So I really like this update, although I do wish that there was position and scale controls here inside properties panel. You can see that there's position and scale here when you just select one graphic. Why can't we have that for all of them? 
you know? So that's one piece of feedback that I would give to Adobe and I'm sure that they are working on that. But wait a minute, what about Essential Graphics? Well, Essential Graphics has now been renamed to graphics templates and there's no longer any controls here. This is just where you can import your mogurts or browse different mogurts inside of Adobe Stock. So you no longer use this panel for editing. Everything is done in properties, which I think in the long run just makes a little bit more sense. Same thing for sound. If we select an audio clip in our timeline, we get a couple basic controls and properties such as volume. You can see that I've lowered the volume of this. You can also mute it. But if you need more controls, for example, I can lasso and select all these sound effects here. I can actually click on this ellipsis here and I can click on open more audio controls. And what this does is it brings open the essential sound panel and I can label all of these as sound effects. And then I can make some more adjustments such as adding some outside reverb and making adjustments this way. And you can also browse effects and browse, for example, Adobe Stock audio. So I think Adobe's heading in the right direction to really simplify the process of manipulating your clips using the properties panel. I think there's a little bit more work to be done. For example, I would love to be able to lasso and select all of these clips and have a more upgraded masking tool here, that would be awesome. So if Adobe are watching this, let's talk about it. I think that would be very useful. So I also wanna give an update on the remote workspace me and my team use to share all of our files. So earlier this year, we switched to LucidLink and essentially LucidLink is like a cloud storage that can act as a remote drive on your computer. So I can, add media, I can upload my project file, my editors can add their own media and also open up the same project file and everything stays online. So you might be thinking, how does it work and how is it any different from Dropbox or any other cloud storage? Well, first of all, it is optimized for video editing. So you can mount your workspace to your drive. This is the look and design of how the desktop client is going to look later this fall. And you can see it looks like a little drive that can mount to your computer. So inside the drive, you can have any type of file structure that you want. For example, I started this new project that Rickard, my editor, is going to edit. If I wanna drop in the screen recording file that he'll need to use to edit, you can see there's a little icon that it's uploading. And once it's done uploading, Rickard will be able to see this file instantaneously and he doesn't have to download it. What he's able to do with LucidLink is stream the file over his internet connection. Now you might be like, well, Gal, what if my internet connection isn't good and I wanna edit locally? This is where pinning comes in handy. So if I go to window extensions, lucid link, and essentially this panel allows you to pin the media that is just inside of your project in the current sequence that you're working on. So this media that's pinning right now is being saved to the lucid link local cache, which you control the size of and the location of it. It can be on your internal drive or an external SSD, for example. So now if I go inside this folder where I have all this demo media, you can see that there's now a little pinned icon next to it, meaning that it's been stored in the local cache. In terms of updates, LucidLink is expanding their ecosystem so you can access your LucidLink file space from almost any type of device. So if you're interested in LucidLink and you wanna try out this new 3.0 beta, I've put a link just down below. Thanks so much to LucidLink for sponsoring this segment of the video. And now let's jump in to more detail inside the color management update. So remember when I showed you the two raw red clips, those were automatically converted, right? So if we go to Lumetri Color and you click on settings, you can see underneath the source clip that Adobe automatically recognized that it was red log footage, right? And it should do that for all the supported camera types now. They pretty much support all of them. But what about these other clips? that have not been converted to the correct color space automatically. Well, that's because these video clips did not come straight from my SD card here as log. I downloaded these as stock video clips from Artlist, which have the log option, but these clips have been transcoded and that original metadata that it was log from that particular camera is now missing. Now I have notified Adobe about this and they are aware of it and they're working with Artlist right now to figure out if there's a way to bring that metadata back. So the way to hack it to bring back in the color here is we go to our footage and let's select all of these DGI clips that we have here and right click 
and go to modify color. So in this case, we're going to choose D log M, but look at how many different options we have here. So Premiere Pro supports a lot. So let's go ahead and press OK. And now you can see these have the correct color now. So there's just that one little hack you have to do with stock footage that is technically log, even though that metadata is lost. Another thing that's important, if this is not working for you and you're like, wait, it's not auto tone mapping at all, and you do have true log footage, make sure you go to your file, you go to project settings and you go to color and make sure that auto detect log video color space is turned on or it will not work. And now let's get into some performance and some UI updates. For this current update, they have hardware acceleration now for ABC and HEVC, which is that high uh, efficiency video Kodak. They also have three times render speeds for ProRes video, which is great. So if you work with ProRes, you're probably ecstatic right now about that. And they have a massive dynamic link update. Remember when I was talking about color, this color tone mapping? Well, if I wanted to right click on this and send this to After Effects and do some sort of rotoscoping, it'll maintain that same color so you don't get any discrepancy between the two programs. So that's kind of the main update in terms of dynamic link. Also, you may have noticed just through me editing this that we have a little bit more of a refresh designed here. You have some more visual consistency with the other apps and rounded corners and all of the panels. So it just looks a lot nicer. Also, if you go into Premiere Pro settings and you go to appearance, you have three options now, darkest, dark, and light. I prefer just the standard dark with the accessible contrast because I can just see things a lot better. So that pretty much covers everything new that is coming to Premiere Pro. Remember, you influence how these things are developed, what else is added to them. So please, please download the beta because you have access to it too with an Adobe Creative Cloud subscription. You can influence how it's going to get developed and you can find bugs too before it's released into the main version. Let me know what you think in a comment below. And as always, keep creating better video with Gal. See you next time. Bye. Whoop.